nuclear chemistry is different from the chemistry we've talked about up till now because traditional chemistry works with the electrons, whereas nuclear chemistry, the actual nucleus of an atom, is changing. Radioactive refers to unstable atoms that give off excess matter, energy, or both as ionizing radiation. So what makes a nucleus stable or not? It is the ratio of protons to neutrons. So in this graph here, the x-axis is the number of protons, the y-axis is the number of neutrons, and this line right through the middle is where they're equal. So you can see that most atoms need a little bit more neutrons. The blue region is non-radioactive, stable elements, and the green is radioactive. So they exist, but they're not stable. And outside of the green region, no elements actually exist because it's not stable at all. So elements in the green region, their nucleus is going to change to try and get them to the blue region. And that's what causes elements, or in this case isotopes, to be unstable. So with radioactive reactions, you wouldn't just think of just carbon because one isotope of carbon might be stable and another not stable. So we're going to be dealing with specific isotopes rather than whole categories of an element. So let's review the notation we used for isotopes, that we have the chemical symbol. So for example, we'd have carbon, and then that number above is the mass number, so 12, that's protons and neutrons, and the number below is the atomic number or number of protons. So we'll be using this notation a lot in nuclear chemistry because it the isotope makes a difference, and so we'll look at specific isotopes. We'll have some other symbols like a proton, a neutron, and an electron. And always the top number is the mass number, and the bottom number is the number of protons. And you can see the electron, they give it a negative one because it's, it's like a negative proton. There are four types of natural radioactive decay, so we're going to go over those and talk about them. You're going to see these on the final, and you might want to put a little something on your index card showing what they each are. The first one is alpha, and let's use this Greek symbol right here, that's alpha. And what it is is a helium nucleus, so 4,2-He is the particle, that's an alpha particle. And the way it works is that if an element undergoes alpha decay, and there's a picture of this right here, that the nucleus will shoot off this particle of helium, this 4,2. So to show you an example of how the reaction works, uranium-238 undergoes alpha decay. So this, this is called the parent. So the parent nucleide is going to give off this particle, the 4,2-He, plus another element. So we're going to figure out what that other element is based on these numbers. And this is the simplest math that we've done all semester. So our bottom numbers are going to add up. So 2 plus some number is equal to 92. So I know my bottom number is 90, because 90 plus 2 equals 92. And then my top number plus 4 equals 238. So the top number has to be 234. So simple, simple math. The arrow is like your equal sign. The top numbers, one side and the other side of the arrow add up. The bottom number's the same. So now I'm going to go to my periodic table to see what element number 90 is. So looking at the top numbers, 90 is element TH. So that's the element that has 90 protons. And that's an example of an alpha decay. So let's look at the next one, is a beta decay. So a beta decay is 0 minus 1 electron. It's like giving off an electron. So we look at our particles. So carbon-14 undergoes beta decay. So we're going to have a 0 minus 1 electron plus, and then our, our resulting isotope, which is called the daughter. So we have our parent 
and our daughter nucleide. In this case, some number minus 1 equals 6. Well, that's 7 for the bottom number. And some number plus 0, well, that's going to be 14. And then element number 7, notice nitrogen is element number 7. And that's beta decay. So what are we doing here? Notice the alpha decay. What that did is it gave you a smaller element. And so uh, very heavy elements are not stable. Bismuth is the biggest stable element. So alpha decay helps uh, an isotope becomes smaller, which makes it more stable. Beta changes a neutron to a proton. We used to have seven, I'm sorry, six protons, and now we have seven. And so that gets the proton-neutron ratio more stable, and that's why it undergoes beta decay. Now, gamma decay is just energy. It has no mass. It's only energy. So a gamma is high energy radiation. And so this often happens with other. So this equation I'm here showing you right here happens with an alpha. So uranium-238-92, which we saw above, gives off energy as well as the 4,2 helium and the 234-90 thorium. So this reaction shows both alpha and gamma. So the point of gamma is to release excess energy. And the last one is positron, and it doesn't have a Greek letter to go with it, but it's like the reverse of a beta. So this, we're going to have a 0 plus 1 electron. And so it has no mass, but it has a positive charge. So what is that? It's not a proton, because a proton would have mass. It's like the reverse of an electron. It's like matter and antimatter. And that's what a positron is here. And so we look at what our daughter is going to be. So some number plus 1 is 15. So that's going to be 14. And our top number is 30. And then I look to see element 14 is silicon, Si. And that's the reaction. And so what that results in is changing a proton into a neutron. So the mass stays the same, but that proton-neutron ratio changes. And so these are the types of naturally occurring radioactive decay. We talked about gamma radiation. It is electromagnetic radiation. It's like light, only higher energy. It has no charge and no mass. And it's usually emitted in conjunction with other types of radiation. And it's very dangerous because it um, is so high energy. So gamma rays are something we need to protect from. So here's some practice problems. And I recommend you pause it and try these on your own. And then you can start again and watch me do them. So PO214 decays by alpha emission. So our parent is going to be PO, and the 214 is the top number. The bottom number isn't always given, because you can find it on your periodic table. So I'm finding PO, and it is element number 84. So that's my reactant side, or my parent. It decays by alpha which is a 4,2 helium. If you don't remember that, put it on your card so you'll have it in front of you. And then we just make the numbers work. Something plus 2 is 84. Well, that's 82. And something plus 4 is 214. That's 210. And so I find element 82 is lead PB. Then PB210, so we're starting with our daughter, and now it's the parent, 21082PB, decays by beta emission. Okay, So beta is going to be a 0 minus 1 electron, plus our bottom number is going to be 83. 83 minus 1 is 82, and then the top number is going to be 210. And element number 83 is bismuth, Bi. 
then carbon 11 decays by positrons. So carbon 11, and then you check the periodic table, carbon's atomic number is 6. Positron, 0, plus 1 electron, plus, um, so 1 plus some number is 6, so that's got to be a 5 and an 11. And element number five is boron. We can also go the direction, the other direction, if we know the daughter, what was the parent? Okay, and so that's what these are. So we don't know what we're starting with, but we know alpha. So that's four two H E. Results in two thirty T H. So I look what 230 is. No, I look what TH is. Sorry about that. TH is 90. And I'm going to erase this because I don't think you can even read that. That is supposed to be 230. And so we just add up the bottom numbers. 2 plus 90, that's 92. And I add up the top numbers, that's 234. Then I find element number 92 is uranium. And that's how you find the parent from the daughter. Here's another example. So we don't know what we're starting with. X decays by beta, which is 0 minus 1 electron, to give 206 Pb. Then I find PB, its number is 82. Now to find the parent, I do 82 minus 1, that's 81. And then 206 plus 0, 206. Then I find element 81 is TL. So TL, not to be confused with TI. They look kind of similar sometimes. So that's thallium. And then the last one, X, so our unknown parent, decays by positron. So we have positron, 0 plus 1 electron, to give carbon 13. 13 carbon, and carbon's atomic number is 6, number of protons. Remember that bottom number comes from the periodic table. And then 6 plus 1 is 7. 13 is still the top number, and element number 7 is nitrogen. So those are a couple of ways to do um, nuclear reactions. The other thing I could have asked you for is the particle. So I could give you the parent and the daughter, and you could figure out the particle. It's very simple math. Here's the answers typed out, so it's maybe a little easier to see. The half-life is the time it takes for half of a radioactive nucleide in a sample to decay. So every radioactive nucleide has a unique half-life. And you look in your book, there is a table of different half-lives of different elements. And they range from very short in milliseconds to hundreds of thousands of years. So the big variation and each one has a unique half-life. And the way it works, if you were to plot um, the time versus the mass of a sample, and, and so let's say you start out with the mass, and then after one half-life, so we'll call that T half, the mass will be half what it was. And after another half-life, the mass cuts in half again. And after another half-life, it cuts in half again. So you get this kind of a graph where you get less and less, and each half-life you have half as much as you had before. And we're going to use this half-life to be able to calculate how much of a sample will be left after a certain amount of time. So here's an example problem of that. 
And the math can be pretty complicated, but we're going to make it simple by just making a half-life table. And we'll just look at whole numbers and so you can see the concept of what's going on. Iodine-131 is used to measure the activity of the thyroid gland. So one of the uses of radioactive nuclei is to put them in the body, and then you can use imaging to see if they're being used to understand uh, the, the functioning of the body. So the thyroid uses iodine, and then if you can see this iodine is not being taken up in the thyroid, you know the thyroid gland is not functioning right. So in this problem, 88 milligrams of iodine are ingested. How much remains after 24 days? And so we're going to make a table of time. That's this time versus mass. And it might be mass, it might be activity. It may talk about um, disintegrations per minute, or it might be mass. In this case, it's mass. And so we always start at time zero. At the very beginning, we had 88 milligrams. So that's where I get this number. My given number is the very beginning. And then in the time column, we're going to add the T half. We're adding the half-life. So here the half-life is eight days. So our first increment is going to be eight days. And then in the math column, I'm going to divide by two every time. So after eight days, we're going to have a half as much. So that's going to go to 44 milligrams. All right, and we're looking for 24 days. So I'm going to keep marching down the time column till I hit 24 days. So what's my next increment? I'm going to add 8. So my next increment is going to be 16 days. And in this column, I'm always going to divide by 2. So 44 divided by 2, now it's going to be 22 milligrams. All right, what's my next time increment going to be? Add 8. And now I get to 24 days. You may have been tempted to say 32 days. Don't times by 2. In this column, you're adding. So 24 days, and that's the time I wanted. And in this column, I'm always going to divide by 2. So that's 11 milligrams. And that's going to be my final answer. At 24 days, I have 11 milligrams. So here it is written in a table format. Here's another one. I recommend you try it yourself and then watch me do it. So a sample of plutonium-239 waste from a nuclear reactor has an activity of 20,000 disintegrations per minute. So here we're going to look at activity instead of mass. It works the same way. How many years will it take for the activity to decrease to 625 dpms? So our table is going to be time and activity. My touch screen isn't working so great. This is, let me just erase that and write it better. This one is time versus activity. So we always start at time zero. At the very beginning, our activity was 20,000. Disintegrations per minute. Okay, our half-life is 24,000 years. So that's going to be our first time increment, 24,000 years. So after that amount of time, what will happen to the activity? Cuts in half, it'll be 10,000 dpm. Okay, what are we going for? We're looking for activity to be 625. So we'll keep going down the activity column until we hit 625. So our next time increment, we're adding 24,000. So this is going to be 48,000. And this will cut in half, 5,000. Okay, adding 24, this becomes 72,000. Years, cut in half, 2,500. We're still not to 625, so we keep going down. So I'm going to do it on my calculator, 72 plus 24, 
So my next one is 96,000 years. And then I'm going to do divide by 2, 1, 2, 5, 0. Oh. DPM's still not there, so I keep going. So 96 plus 24. This is 120,000 years. And my activity cut that in half. 625 DPMs. Oh, I got to DMP, sorry. DPMs. That's true here. This is DPMs. Okay, and that is our answer. It's 120,000 years for the activity to decrease to 625 disintegrations per minute. This application is on uh, nuclear waste, and this is actually an isotope that occurs in nuclear waste, and it, some of the isotopes have incredibly long half-lives, which is one of the problems with nuclear waste. And so here you can see that worked out as well. Essential skills. And this presentation didn't include all the slides you'll find in the non-narrated slideshow. And so there's a lot of interesting things that I recommend you read through. But these are the things that you're going to find on the final. First, identify nuclear particles, alpha, beta, positron, and gamma. And remember, gamma is not really a particle. It is energy. And then write nuclear reactions. And I recommend you put those particles on your note card so you don't have to memorize them, and then you'll have them to write the reactions. And do simple half-life calculations with whole numbers, so ones that work with the table.